December 1950. Jet fighters roar across the skies above Korea. For half a century, dogfights have been won or lost with propeller planes driven by piston engines. Now, for the first time in history, swept-wing fighters with jet engines slug it out at extreme altitudes and near supersonic speeds. American F-86 Sabres head-to-head -head against the communist MiGs. Their contrails will write a new chapter in the annals of air warfare in a place called MiG Alley. Experience the battle, dissect the tactics, relive the dogfights. August 5, 1952. Four U.S. Air Force F-86 Sabres move into the hostile skies of MiG Alley above Northwest Korea. For over two years, nimble Russian-built MiG-15 fighters have been darting from sanctuaries in China, challenging American bombers and fighters. The Sabre flight is led by Captain Robinson Reisner, his mission is to find the MiGs and kill them. All eyes are outside the cockpit, scanning, searching for a contrail, a telltale flash of metal. Suddenly, there they are, eight silver MiGs passing left to right, a thousand feet below. Perfect setup. Too perfect. I can still remember seeing those MiGs below me. That was unusual. Anytime you saw MiGs below you, it was an exciting thing. But we learned quickly to suspect the situation. Reisner instinctively calls check six. His wingman responds, lead, we've got MiGs at three o'clock. Six MiGs scream in from overhead, lethal cannon flashing. The Sabres are in a trap. Now they are the prey. Reisner calls a right break. The Sabres stand on one wing, pull hard around. Neck muscles strain to keep heads upright against the heavy pull of G. The Sabres turn into the face of the enemy. Reisner is screaming headlong into his first life and death encounter in Big Alley. Two years earlier, on June 25, 1950, the North Korean People's Army swarmed across the 38th parallel, the dividing line between the Communist North and the Republic of South Korea. U.S. armed forces under United Nations auspices are committed to the fight. The North Koreans have the manpower and tanks, but their primitive air force is quickly shot to ribbons. American aircraft are free to roam the skies. Communist troop concentrations and supply lines are relentlessly pounded from the air. It had a great effect because we were able in a lot of circumstances to either curtail or certainly uh, decrease the uh, amount of enemy army activity. But then, in November 1950, the Americans are stunned by the appearance of new Soviet-built MiG-15 jet fighters. With a top speed of 670 miles per hour, the MiG is 100 miles per hour faster than older F-80 and F-84 jets in Korea. The critical air supremacy achieved early in the war is now in jeopardy. The MiG was built as a point interceptor. It was light, it had a lighter wing loading, it didn't carry as much fuel, which limited the range, but made it very good for climbing purposes and turning purposes. It was optimized to shoot down B-29s. That's why it had the heavy cannon armament that it did, 223 millimeters and a, uh, a 37 millimeter. The cannon was really a surprising weapon. 
if the guy was within about seven or 800 feet behind you and he fired it, you could feel the vibration in your rudder pedals. When that happened to you, you knew you better do something pretty quick, left or right, <laughs> but don't stay where you are. The MiG-15s dash from bases in China, just across the North Korean border. Any aircraft venturing into a 6,000 square mile slice of airspace above Northwest Korea is vulnerable. American airmen call it MiG Alley. It is here that the fiercest air battles of the Korean War will be etched across the cold blue sky. The U.S. Air Force rushes the 4th Fighter Interceptor Wing to Korea. The 4th is equipped with the new F-86A Sabre jet. It is the only airplane in the Western arsenal that approaches the MiG's capabilities. The F-86 was my very favorite plane that I've ever flown, which I used to kiddingly call my little sports car. The F-86 was a pure fighter. It was not intended to intercept or shoot down enemy bombers, but it was meant to take on enemy fighters, destroy them, and achieve air superiority. The Sabre is a strong, maneuverable, and stable gun platform, the very qualities needed in a good fighter aircraft. Although the Sabre is slightly faster in the crucial areas of rate of climb and altitude, the MiG is superior. That's assuming that you got the same pilots operating both of them. One of the main things that we enjoyed over the communist aircraft was that our pilots were better trained and we had better tactics eventually. F-86s launched their first combat air patrols into MiG Alley in December 1950. Captain Bruce Hinton takes first blood for the Sabre on December 17th. The F-86s do well. But there are 400 MiGs based across the Yalu. In 1950, there are fewer than 50 Sabres in Korea. Even though outnumbered, the experience and esprit of the Sabre pilots makes the critical difference in MiG Alley. It's called flight suit attitude. Robbie Reisner has it. Arriving in Korea in the spring of 1952, Reisner's flying skills are quickly recognized. He soon advances to flight lead status. Today, in MiG Alley, Reisner's Sabre flight has just been jumped by eight MiG 15s. They normally had high escort. My wingman called out. We had uh, more MiGs coming in on our three o'clock position, making a pass on us. The MiGs are higher and have the speed advantage. If the Sabres continue straight and level, they present broadside targets to the MiGs. If they turn left, the MiGs will attack from the rear. Reisner's only option is to turn directly into the attackers, presenting a smaller cross-section while forcing the MiGs to overshoot. Reisner calls a hard break into the MiGs. Being a typical fighter pilot, flying that wonderful F-86, we weren't really concerned about these guys. We didn't want them to hit us, though. So we broke into them, made a high G turn into them, the abrupt maneuver derails the ambush. Two MiGs overshoot and streak by. The F-86s reverse. As the MiGs dive at the Americans, the Sabres make a hard climbing turn directly into them. The MiGs overshoot. The Sabres then reverse their direction, putting them on their attackers 6 o'clock. The tables have turned within seconds, the hallmark of jet age combat in MiG Alley. I took Paley and Charlie because he's the closest one to me. And I put the pepper on the tailpipe, pulled the triggers, 
he lit up like a Christmas tree. You see, we had armor-piercing incendiary bullets in those 650 caliber machine guns. The burst riddles the bandit's engine. The MiG pulls into a climbing turn in a desperate attempt to shake his tormentor. Trailing smoke, the MiG claws for altitude. The smoke suddenly stops, his engine quits. The MiG coasts upward, bleeding off airspeed. Reisner's F-86 shudders as he chops power and pops his speed brakes to stay in trail. The MiG hangs suspended, motionless, then drops off into a spin. The F-86 buffets as it too loses energy and enters a stall. Reisner kicks in left rudder, nose is over, fires another burst into the spiraling MiG, only 300 feet away. It was a thrill to hear those guns chattering, because something was going to happen up in front, and sure enough, it did. 50 caliber, armor-piercing incendiary rounds slam into the MiG's aft fuselage. The vertical stabilizer is blown clear away. The MiG pilot ejects. The fight is over. It is Reisner's first kill. I'll tell you, that was a grand feeling. We were doing what we were assigned to do, and that was to knock every big down we could. And that's what I did. <laughs> this fight is just a prelude. Four months later, Reisner will lock horns with the best pilot he's ever seen in one of the most heart-stopping encounters of MiG Alley. September 15, 1952. Captain Robbie Reisner is leading a flight of four F-86s into MiG Alley. It's four months since his first kill. In the effort to maintain air supremacy in the MiG-infested area, the Sabres are escorting F-84 fighter bombers to an industrial area near the mouth of the Yalu River. The mission profile puts Reisner's flight into a protective orbit over what is normally prohibited Chinese airspace and directly above the largest concentration of MiG airfields in Manchuria. Midway into their protective sweep, the Sabres run into four MiGs. The MiGs bank away as if retreating from the area. Reisner suspects a trick. He continues tracking the enemy fighters. Sure enough, the MiGs turn back. They're heading for the bombers. The MiGs are initiating one of the Korean War's most remarkable encounters. Although at maximum range, the Sabre's radar-ranging gun sight finds the target with deadly efficiency. One of the technological advantages that the F-86 had over the MiG, as opposed to aerodynamic uh, features, was that the 86 had a radar-ranging gun sight. And that meant that Sabre pilot could get a fast, accurate tracking solution on a maneuvering enemy target, and it would automatically compensate for the ballistic drop of those 50 caliber rounds. And when it was working properly, it was deadly accurate because the first round would likely impact on target. Reisner's machine guns shatter the MiG's canopy. The other three MiGs run away. Reisner, covered by his wingman, counters the MiG's turn. Fires another burst. The MiG initiates violent evasive action in an attempt to get Reisner off his tail. He noses over into a dive, rolls inverted, then rolls again. The MiG pilot demonstrates superb mastery of his machine. He will put Reisner's flying skills to the ultimate test. 
This is a special breed of aviator. When MiGs first encountered Sabres in 1950, they usually made diving attacks from higher altitudes. They rarely maneuvered or turned into the F-86s to fire another burst. This was largely due to the inexperience of the communist pilots, as well as the MiGs' limited range. But there was another reason. Moscow and Peking needed to hide the identities of their airmen. The Soviets were using MiG Alley as a clandestine training arena. Russian pilots couldn't fly within 60 miles of UN lines or over the Yellow Sea for fear of being picked up and their true identities revealed. The Russians even strafed one of their own pilots who had parachuted into the ocean. In the summer of 1951, the Soviets changed their tactics, replacing trainees with instructors and high-time fighter pilots, veterans of the Great Patriotic War. The Americans call them honchos, Japanese slang for big shot. And they are good. Today, Reisner is tangling with a honcho he will never forget. The MiG was so aggressive, he also was so well-trained, he did not intend for me to get right behind him and shoot him down. So what he did was, he turned that thing upside down and split S. That means he reversed his direction. The split S is a commonly used fighter reversal technique. The aircraft rolls inverted and dives, pulling out in the opposite direction. He was so low, and I was, I was sure he wasn't going to make it. And I said to my wingman, this is going to be the easiest kill I ever had. Well, it turned out this guy made it. There should have been a fireball, but the MiG recovers miraculously into a dry riverbed. Reisner watches in disbelief as the MiG twists and turns right on the deck. He was so close to the ground, he kicked rocks and debris up. I, meanwhile, had managed to get in behind him. I got dents all over my airplane where he knocked rocks, blew rocks up off of the riverbed. Well, from there on, it was a real fight. This guy was some pilot. Reisner can barely keep the stick in his hands as he's thumped hard by the MiG's jet wash. The MiG flies like a banshee. He chops power, pops out his speed brakes. The MiG is trying to force the Sabre to overshoot, which will expose Reisner to the MiG's cannon. Reisner counters by rolling his jet over the MiG, bleeding off airspeed while keeping on his adversary's six o'clock. Then, the MiG firewalls the throttle and accelerates away in a hard turn pulling maximum G. He took me on a mad race, and I'd get in a shot at him every once in a while. We were tenacious as a bulldog. We just didn't want to turn him loose. The MiG reverses his turn. Another burst from Reisner. Parts of the tail fly off. The fuselage begins to smoke. Reisner can't believe his eyes. The MiG goes inverted, pushes vertically up the side of a mountain and over the top. When that happens, you're putting negative Gs on your body. Your eyeballs pop out about this four. The blood rushes to your head, you can get a red out. I wouldn't even attempt it. I have to do a half roll and pull down. Down again in the riverbed. The MiG chops power. Reisner reacts instinctively to slow with the MiG. I coasted right up beside him, wingtip to wingtip. I looked into his cockpit. He looked right into my cockpit. He raised his fist and shook it at me, and I thought, man, this is like the movies. <laughs> but it's not a movie. The MiG suddenly banks to the right. Reisner is snapped back to the moment. Black puffs of anti-aircraft fire fill the sky. The honcho has led them directly over a Chinese airbase. 
September 15, 1952, a desperate but enormously skilled MiG pilot has led Robbie Reisner and his wingman on a wild, twisting chase all the way to his home base, Tak Tung Kao, 35 miles inside China. Anti-aircraft fire surrounds the Sabres. He was so low, he'd blown dust off the runway. He must have called ahead and said, shoot these guys off of my tail. The wingman's name was Joe Logan. Then he said, hey, lead, they're shooting us. Well, they certainly were. And the guns were shooting from everywhere. And black uh, explosions all around us. But it didn't concern me enough to turn him loose, I'll guarantee. I was behind him, and that's where I was going to stay, and I did. Reisner can't drop low enough for a clean shot. The MiG runs out of options, pulls up sharply into a climbing turn. When he ran out of runway and he pulled up, I was able to get an angle off, which I needed. I hit him heavy. The MiG's wing is shredded by the Sabre's guns. His only chance for survival is to land immediately, forcing or spiking the jet onto the ground, and hope for the best. Reisner has another idea. He never put his gear down. He made a 180 degree turn, and when he was headed back down, it looked like he was gonna land beside the runway, not on the runway, in the grass. Well, I poured all my ammunition into him at that time. Every 50 caliber I had was chattering. He never completely leveled off. The MiG slams into the ground and explodes. Hot shards of burning metal and debris slice through a line of parked MiGs. Reisner's wingman exults at the fiery spectacle. And old Joe Logan was so enthusiastic, he said, hey, lead, you just destroyed the Air Force. <laughs> what a wonderful sight. The whole engagement has lasted some five minutes. The MiG is destroyed, but the mission is far from over. The Sabres must run a gauntlet of deadly radar-controlled anti-aircraft artillery to get across the Yalu and back to home base. Throughout the war, crossing into Chinese airspace was officially forbidden, except in cases of hot pursuit. But aggressive flight leaders routinely violated orders so they could engage the MiGs on their own turf. Cruising for MiGs in Manchuria was conducted within a conspiracy of silence. Flight leaders chose wingmen who would play along and keep quiet. Squadron commanders didn't discuss it and many rolls of incriminating gun camera film mysteriously disappeared. Leaving a trail of flaming MiG wreckage in their wake, Reisner and his wingman turned south, out of China. Joe Logan got hit in the belly with an aircraft fire. He started losing fuel, and I ran over and uh, got under him to check him out. Well, it was evident he was not gonna make it because he was really pumping that fuel overboard. The jets are over hostile terrain. The closest rescue point is Chodo Island, a hundred miles to the south. It's too far away. Reisner is going to do something unprecedented. I had him throttle back gradually and uh, let the nose down and I don't know where I got the wild idea. Nobody had done it before. What I did was I hooked my nose in his tailpipe. In a display of superb airmanship, for over half an hour, Reisner repeatedly nudges his wingman's lifeless jet over the sea. With rescue planes in sight, Logan tells Reisner he'll see him back at Kimpo. Then he ejects. Now, Joe landed in the water. Uh, the choppers and the amphibians were having an argument who got to rescue him. Well, the choppers finally won by saying, it's my turn. You got the last one. 
the helicopter attempts to use its rotor wash to fill Logan's parachute and blow him to shore. The young pilot is ensnared in his parachute lines. Some of the uh, rip cords tangled around Joe's neck and he drowned. So after all that effort, we lost Joe Logan. There is a war to be fought. Two days later, Robbie Reisner scores another kill in MiG Alley. He'll leave Korea with a total of eight MiGs to his credit. Robbie Reisner will return to combat in Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War, flying F-105 Thunder Chiefs into the heavily defended North. In September 1965, he is shot down and sent to the infamous Hanoi Hilton. Seven years later, Reisner will emerge, battered, but with spirit unbroken. It is the same flight suit attitude that led him to vanquish his enemies 20 years earlier in Mig Alley. June 30th, 1953. By now, the ground fighting in Korea has seesawed back and forth for three years, grinding to a virtual stalemate. Ceasefire talks have dragged on for two years. There is a palpable sense that peace could break out at any moment. The communist air training program in Manchuria is rotating as many students and instructors through MiG Alley as possible for combat experience. On this clear June day, Captain Ralph Parr is only too willing to oblige. He's part of a four-ship Sabre sweep into the Hornet's Nest. Today, on his very first flight into MiG Alley, Parr will be locked into an extended adrenaline-pumping duel with a MiG honcho. Flight leader is Vermont Gary Garrison, 335th Squadron Commander. The flight moves into combat spread. Parr sees movement at his one o'clock position. I called the flight out, and we had a flight of 16 MiGs flying almost opposite us. Undetected. The four sabers stalk the 16 MiGs like cheetahs moving through tall grass. The MiGs don't know we're there. And we're closing on them, slowly. I'm doing everything but pushing my airplane by hand, trying to get it to go faster. I'm quietly saying to myself, don't shoot yet, Gary. Gary, don't shoot. Don't shoot yet. Sabre tactics in MiG Alley emphasize the finger four, two pairs of two sabers, with each pair or element providing mutual support and protection. If I spotted a MiG, my number two man, he knows that from that, that, that call on, I'm not going to be looking around at all. Only the flight lead, the most experienced pilot, would fire on a MiG. The second most experienced pilot was number three, or element lead. He was the alternate shooter in case the flight got separated. Numbers two and four were wingmen, newer pilots, who at all times were to protect the flight leads or element leads rear end. The high-speed combat of MiG Alley demanded hawk-like awareness and concentration. The key to winning and surviving was flight integrity. When we're talking about tactics, integrity doesn't have anything to do with uh, telling lies or things of that nature. This has to do with maintaining the uh, cohesive force. A, a flight goes out and it's trained to go out and fight as a four-ship flight. It sees the enemy, it fights as a four-ship flight, and it comes back as a four-ship flight. That's integrity. Before they arrived in Korea, 
New Sabre pilots went through grueling F-86 training at the Air Force Fighter School at Nellis Air Force Base, Nevada. So many pilots were killed at Nellis in simulated dogfights that new arrivals were told only half-jokingly. If you see the flag at full staff, take a picture. Even the greenest F-86 pilot arrived in Korea with a high level of training. Captain Ralph Parr was more than ready. He knew Korea well, having flown F-80s in support of ground troops in 1950. After his F-80 tour, Parr returns to the States and to the cockpit of the F-86. He earns a reputation as one of the most skilled and aggressive Sabre instructor pilots. In fighter pilot lingo, Parr is a good stick, and he's champing at the bit to kill MiGs. In the summer of 1953, with the fourth fighter wing, Parr will demonstrate his deadly prowess. Four F-86s are tracking 16 unsuspecting MiGs. Vermont Garrison, the flight leader, is the shooter. Ralph Parr is hoping upon hope that Garrison will hold his fire. Wait till I get into position, and we'll get two at the same time. And of course, I can't say this on the open radio, because it would tip the enemy off. Garrison doesn't wait. He shoots. One MiG is hit, goes inverted, dives away. Garrison stayed on him, cut the corner, swung in behind him. It's going to be an easy kill. Garrison, followed by his wingman, dives after the smoking MiG. And the next thing I hear, I hear a voice, and it's Garrison, and he says, my guns won't fire. The stricken MiG is here. Garrison, whose guns have jammed, is here. Suddenly, the MiG leader, moving to protect one of his stricken flock, jumps into the fight. The leader of the 16 MiGs does a very fast turn reversal and heads straight for Garrison and Garrison's wingman. Parr is impressed by this aggressive move. He's done this before. He's pretty highly experienced. Parr quickly sizes up the situation. Garrison and his wingmen are now vulnerable to the MiG leader's guns. Parr maneuvers to cut off the aggressive MiG. He slams the stick over in a hard left turn. Blood rushes from his head. The G-suit instantly inflates, squeezes his abdomen and thighs in a python grip. Though out of range, Parr fires a short burst to scare the MiG off Garrison's tail. It works. MiG leader breaks away. Parr gives chase, maneuvers for a clean shot. I latched onto this guy at about the ballpark of about 1,800 feet and brought my pipper up and put the pipper on his fuselage, getting ready to, to shoot him. And he started his maneuvering. And we had a dogfight that lasted six minutes before the first shot was fired. MiG lead is a honcho and one hell of a pilot. He jinks frantically, turning hard left, then right. He throws his jet around the sky, rolling and twisting. The red pilot tries multiple split S reversals, anything to shake Parr off his tail and turn the tables on his attacker. The MiG leader is skilled and not ready to die. Parr hangs in but can't draw a bead. This honcho may live to fight another day. It had reached a point where I didn't know whether I was going to know how to let him go or not. 
The MiG is sliding out of reach, but the Sabre has a technological edge that will decide the contest. June 30th, 1953. In MiG Alley, the battle has turned into a giant swirling furball, like something out of World War II, but faster and higher. Captain Ralph Parr is in the thick of it. We went into just a roaring gunfight between 20 aircraft, four of Mars. Fortunately for Parr, the machine in which he's staking his very existence had reached its ultimate expression by 1953. The F-86A models that first went to Korea in December 1950 were excellent gun platforms. But they were heavier than the MiGs, and their 5,400-pound thrust engines couldn't get the Sabre up to the MiGs' 50,000-foot altitude. They were also outnumbered, 8 to 1. In December 1951, the 51st Fighter Interceptor Wing joins the fight in MiG Alley. It's now roughly 130 Sabres to 350-plus MiGs. The 51st arrives with F-86Es, which introduce the so-called flying tail to the Sabre. On earlier models of the F-86, the elevator, or up and down control surface on the tail, was unresponsive near supersonic speed. The force of air made it impossible for the pilot to move the stick. A serious handicap in air combat. The E model's totally new flying tail is hydraulically boosted, providing positive elevator control, even at maximum airspeed. In August of 1952, yet another, and the most lethal version of the Sabre, streaks into MiG Alley. The F-86F. The F has a more powerful 6,090-pound thrust engine, bringing the Sabre nearly equal to the MiG in two critical areas. Rate of climb, over 9,000 feet a minute, and service ceiling, 49,000 feet. The Sabre's wing also undergoes a significant change. The movable leading edge slats, originally designed for greater control at low airspeed, disappear. Most jet combat, not all, but most occur, tended to occur at higher airspeeds where uh, the slats were uh, really of not much advantage. The slats are replaced with a new non-movable leading edge that's extended six inches at the wing root and three inches at wing tip. The so-called hard, or 6-3 wing, increases the Sabre's maneuverability at high speeds. The F model was a tremendous improvement. We had a better turning capability, it was faster, better climb, and uh, more closely uh, simulated those characteristics of the MiG that, uh, that we liked so much. The MiG-15 was still lighter, and retained its power-to-weight advantage. But for the first time, the F-86 could maneuver with the MiG on equal terms up to 49,000 feet. On June 30, 1953, the added thrust and maneuverability of the F-86F allows Captain Ralph Parr to stay with the MiG. But he can't get into firing position against an experienced honcho. I could bring my gun sight right up to the airplane, but I couldn't get it on the airplane. In an attempt to get Parr off his tail, MiG leader rolls into another split S and dives. Parr goes inverted, pulls down. The move keeps him on the MiG's tail, still in the chase. At 3,000 feet, the jets pull out of the dive. Parr feels the crush of G on his chest as the horizon slowly reappears. Then, MiG leader raises his nose and slams the throttle forward, 
He's counting on his airplane's superior rate of climb to carry him clear of the Sabre's fangs. All the right moves, but the F model Sabre has the electronic advantage. Parr's radar ranging gun sight can reach out nearly two miles. So I just sat there and very calmly let the gun sight settle down, gave him about a four second burst and shot him to ribbons. The Sabre's 650 caliber machine guns fire at a rate of 110 rounds per second. 28 pounds of lead have just impacted the MiG. The airplane burst into flames. The flames are trailing way back. I throttled back a little bit. And to get a close look at this guy who'd been doing rather well, as I rolled up to look down on him, and I could, I could see that there were slashes from those 50 calibers. They're all, all burning, but fire coming out of just about all of them. The canopy was broken. There was blood in the front end of the canopy and forward of the pilot. And the pilot was down, sort of hanging over his stick. Parr has scored his first kill in MIG Alley, but there's no time to savor the victory. About that time, I heard the distinctive 37 millimeter a cannon going thump, thump, thump. If I could hear him, he was close. Too damn close. Another MiG, which had been following the fight from a distance, has moved in to avenge his leader's demise. Parr instinctively pirouettes. He snaps the Sabre's nose skyward into a hard climbing turn. Pilot is surprised. He overshoots. Parr reverses his turn. The MiG is his. Parr's deft maneuver has put him into a good firing position behind his adversary. He turned left about 45 degrees, and when he rolled level, I knocked him out of the sky. I hit him so he couldn't miss. Two MiGs in rapid succession. Ralph Parr will finish his Sabre tour with 10 victories, a double ace, an achievement matched by only 10 other F-86 pilots. Remarkably, he does it in only 30 missions during the last seven weeks of the war. Parr will stay in the cockpit winning the Air Force Cross for heroism during the Vietnam War. In Korea, the guns fell silent at midnight, July 27, 1953. The battle lines ended almost exactly where they started. No formal truce officially ended the hostilities. The F-86s scored an impressive record in MiG Alley. Against a loss of 78 of their own, the Sabres shot down almost 560 MiGs, seven to one in favor of the F-86. In a war without winners, the battle for air superiority in MiG Alley was the only clear victory. The region remains a powder keg to this day. The sound of jets still reverberates through the mountains of the Korean Peninsula. Mach 2 capable F-15s and F-16s now take to the skies once patrolled by the F-86. In the north, MiG-15s have given way to MiG-21s and advanced MiG-29s. Long-range air-to-air missiles are the weapons of choice for these technological wonders. Should war return to Korea, these modern-day adversaries will engage from miles away. They will never face off in flashing dogfights that were the hallmark of MiG Alley.